Yeah. So yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's keep this. Put, <laughs> put things towards the front if you really want some action. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, November 10th meeting of the Planning Board. Um, we've got a rather uh, interesting agenda tonight. It's uh, an agenda where we've got uh, no big projects, but we've got um, a, a discussion item on uh, uh, issues related to planning. Um, is there any public comment? Uh, hi, Yuri. You're ready for this. Oh, hi, Yuri. Oh. Come on up. <laughs> yeah, pull up a chair, Yuri. Yeah. yeah. Come on up. Oh. We'll just turn that around since it's not you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a presentation, but I can do some of the other things. And um, let's see. I just wanted to pull trying to get them um, I was away last meeting so have you have you we met yeah, is the first time. No. Ah. the introductions you've got a mouthful of donuts how about you Anne I'm Anne Brooks I'm Yuri cold hand yes that's enough okay. yes John Lutz John no, Yuri Devin oh. Bruce oh. and I'll, I'll show is your repeat is going to oh your repeat is if you can see yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's Yuri's good <laughs> I'm Cheryl Linnish, yeah, Planning Office. Oh. Uh, we corresponded. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you in nice person. Nice to meet you. Alan Verson. Mark Sullivan. Nice to meet you. Tess Perone Poe. All right. <coughs> In your honor, you're, we got some donuts. So oh. if you want one. <laughs> Usually I can't have a full all. course meal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all you knew I was coming, huh? Yeah. Um, so let me just. so. There are a couple of things on, the, I guess, um, for the agenda. I should, I'm going to post it. I just lost my agenda here. Um, sorry. So we've got. Um, Good, you need it. So we have been planning to do this meeting a couple of meetings ago to talk about, uh, especially post, I guess, the last, most recent one, but we've had a couple um, of projects before the board where there was some question about. You know, is this the right scale of development? Is the right density? Is the zoning? Are we on the right track in terms of implementation? And um, so we haven't had the full group um, together since since then. So um, uh, sorry. <laughs> so um, this is this is sort of the discussion to sort of kick off what you guys, what information you want to know. I've done some preliminary um, <coughs> look at the total projects that we've had. Like I just went through sort of a mental list of um, projects that um, that um, we, that I could remember, that I could recall, and I'll put those on the screen as soon as I can get this <laughs> up and running. And then um, I just thought we could walk through that as sort of the initial conversation. And we haven't let any interns go yet on the full database of all the permits that have been issued, but I do have a list um, that I'll pull up here. I just want to connect to um, screen here um, to show you the initial list. And um, let's get out of here. Um, as sort of a, a point for discussion. And then on top of that, we sort of had, I think this is a good segue to sort of get back to the conversation uh, where we sort of left off in the zoning changes to look at the URA district. And, and we, I think it's probably been over a year where we took the map and we looked at what parts of URA made sense mm -hmm. to keep, right? What parts made sense to sort of um, to rezone <coughs> to be more reflective of the abutting neighborhoods and um, so I think it would probably be good to have sort of that initial general conversation where have we gone what does it look like how do we feel in terms of the board is this are we on the right track still and then talk about this next step and um, where we are with the urban residential a map changes so um, let me just uh, with that as an opener I think it's a really interesting time for you to join us so um, we're sort of revisiting the changes that we this 
body has put in place and, and sort of seeing what effect they've had on the town. So I'm just going to pull the list up on the screen. I've divided the, so my initial um, uh, project list um, is by sort of projects and then approval not required where there have been some lot divisions and then I have examples of some of those projects. Not, I don't have examples of all of this list. Um, and now if I can just, oh, I don't need to do, I don't do this often enough to remember. Well, it's designed so nicely intuitive. <laughs> that can I ask a diff, uh, off the topic question okay. and I don't know if Mark might be the best um, I saw in the paper that the development at Hospital Hill mm -hmm. is kind of mm -hmm. ending stopping yep. mm -hmm. so I, and I guess, oh. I guess like, what does that what does that mean if anything to us but also what does it mean to the people I mean they talked about deposits and they, I mean will someone else just come in and pick it up or is it uh, I didn't quite understand what it means kind of in so was that in the gazette today or uh, a few days ago i can okay. speak that was away last okay. week so i didn't see um, the so the the co-housing piece of it was yes. the piece that had put down deposit uh, okay and there uh, have been working on this for a couple of years actually doing meetings among the people who wanted to be in the co-housing and um, they did put down deposits. They've not gotten them back. They're actually hoping someone may come in. There was work done for the deposits. I mean, right. there were drawings. There were lots of things that, so it, it didn't like the money didn't go somewhere. It mm -hmm. went to do the services that they, planning services they wanted. So um, they're hoping that someone will come in and pick up there and those deposits so will then pick up the whole development or just the co-housing or the whole because um, it was it, just one part of it it was just one part of it um, I think that'll depend on what mass development can oh. can negotiate with a, n a new developer so, so that so developers out that developers yeah. out yeah. it goes oh, yeah I didn't I must have <coughs> like to have yeah. to look up the Gazette uh, Gazette net and read that because yeah. I was away last week and that's interesting yeah. Yeah. yeah the article in the Gazette did not identify it as the co-housing part but that's just it's the whole piece. it's the whole piece yes, the but, whole, yeah. but people had made deposits for right. the co-housing oh, okay. piece of that bound to come back to us no matter what happens I, I can't okay. imagine that it won't have change that developer had never actually developed anything before it was really? their that was their first go round it was an idea hmm. that they were and so it's it a seemed tough like way to start offer. what's that it was a tough way to start with co-housing well, it's tough at there because that, that was the only piece of property where mass development hadn't done the interest infrastructure the roads right. and utilities which is a, a big nut for a developer to do all that mm -hmm. underground all that utility work before you even get to the, right. the housing lots right. um, and then on top of that <coughs> that the whole co-housing you know, formula right it, and, and so I was I was curious how they could make the numbers work uh, didn't. and apparently they couldn't wow. hmm. mm -hmm. Well, there was something in the article in the Gazette that referred to other problems that the developer was having, okay. not specifically. Uh, the, the article, I thought, was pretty Dr. unclear. Reader. Right. It was, it was very superficial. It was just kind of like this has happened and so it wasn't As far as the deposits, hopefully the people in the co-housing knew that their deposit was at risk. I mean, presumably they did. Yeah. I know, because mass development, they want out. They, they've been there. Right long enough and they just want to wrap it up and get out uh, I, I guess that I mean the good thing is that the plans that you all approve they go with the land so another developer could just <coughs> come in, take oh the and just say and I'll go. do this okay if they want to make changes they would have to come back you don't so I really think it's just going to come in and that's well, I, you know, I don't know. We're of hopeful that they'll be able to find someone else who'd be interested in doing something comparable, if not those plans with maybe just design changes for the structures. Um, but the mass development is working now. I think they just, they, today, they've just put together a new marketing piece um, to sort of send out the show very specific. This is the piece. This is what's been approved, um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So there is movement in that direction. They're definitely trying to... Um, but, I mean, you think of the cost, you know, the, like right on that, the property that abuts that is the one that Jonathan Wright right. recently developed. And you think of the, the size and the cost of those units 
and that's with all that infrastructure in place. And so what are, what's the cost going to be for that property where there is no infrastructure? Right. And so we've been talking about, you know, uh, was it work, work affordable housing or, mm -hmm. um, you know, mix? And so how is that going to happen if, if, if the developer has to do the everything? Um, the, the, um, the other one to the left of the transformations, the one that's mm -hmm. been cleared, mm -hmm. that's Pecoy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, everyone should go take a look at that. I saw it last week, and <clears throat> it's really striking. It's what, you know, we see these plans with lines on paper and pictures, I mean, uh, all, all these details. It's been completely strip mined. Every single living thing on the land is completely gone. Um, and, and it, you know, it was heavily wooded. It's, mm -hmm. it's clear. I mean, it's really shocking to see. Every single living thing on the entire parcel of land is gone. It's I guess, yeah, I guess a blade here and there maybe. If well, I mean, because, because there had been old barns back there, it had been previously disturbed, and but since it had been sitting there for so long, there was a lot of shrub trees that had grown up well, to, um, in the middle of the parcel. Um, maybe, in, so. but it's surround the part that is not stripped bare is surrounded with heavily wooded land, right. not just right. scrub. When you walk around so, it from the backside, especially. Yeah. I just so looked at it from the front. We'll walk from the back, <coughs> like, through the dog park and where it connects up to Smith College, the, like the cross country run, mm. which is a great walk. And then, then all of a sudden, you're on top of, you know, there's like three rows of trees. And then it's just mm. this, it's cleared sure. out and this giant mound of, of land that's just been stripped and covered mm. for erosion. Mm. Um, and, you know, that wasn't there before. It's, it's yeah. striking. Mm. Yeah. I remember doing a lot of talking about how the landscape, I mean, that, that it's, we worked a lot on the plan, so I think we've caught it mid-stride, but um, there were, that was part of the discussion of doing the, the path in a way that people were much happier with. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had that path redesigned around the uh, catch basin in the back. Um, and so, I'm kind of like Carolyn. I think it's stark in what happened to it, but I think that those were a lot of volunteer greenery that grew up, you know, post barn. Well, we'll see. Yeah, that yeah. it's, as I say, it's surrounded by what looks like pretty ma mature yeah. woods. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe there was only scrub trees in right. the middle, but yeah. Yeah. somehow it doesn't mm -hmm. look that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wait, please, mm -hmm. That's going to be. Stark, not more. I think they've already started. They have, yeah. I went by the other day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I went through. This is just a running, uh, um, quick list of the projects that I could calculate <coughs> since 2013, basically. So we've got on um, Phillips Place. Um, there was um, a larger lot where um, they, there was a new building added for two units. Um, Grove Street, um, there were four units added. Um, so we've got a, that project on Day Avenue, three, um, actually two additional units because some of these were <coughs> demolitions for reconstruction. And I can email this list to you um, mm -hmm. so you have it, but this is sort of my um, quick list. Um, then there was a project that didn't come before you, but it was enabled by the zoning, which, uh, which I'll have in my, um, I have a PowerPoint um, showing some of these things, where um, the allowance allowed for an attic unit, essentially, to be placed. So there's no exterior modification, but they were ab able to add a unit. And then Shaw's Motel, which is currently going through um, redevelopment process, actually that building will probably come down by the end of the year. Um, and then Barrett Street, there was one house and there will be 13 units replaced there. And then Hinkley, of course, is the most recent one, um, one single family for eight, eight units. And then we have a list of approval not required. So those are lot divisions. Um, uh, so I came up with, what is this, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or 10 A and R. <coughs> 
so sort of spread out. Northampton, Florence, Leeds, um, and um, t for the most part, they're just new single family house lots. In some cases, a two family. Um, and then in one instance at Hatfield Street, which is a project you reviewed, even though it was also an A&R, there are eight units, and I have that in my presentation. And then there are other two, I just added these two projects that people were talking, there was buzz about it in the community. They were not planning board, um, one of them was a planning board project, but they were pre-zoning change. So I don't know if you remember, on Olive Street, there was a new oh, modern yeah. house put in. Oh, that that's right, that's that right. was before the zoning change, but it, it came through as a special permit because it was <coughs> old zoning that allowed um, dimensional averaging for frontages, so you sort of match what the frontages are on the Which street. Are, where is that? That's the it's one off of that South street. the that temporary piece between the two houses that never was built because the zoning changed. Um, they were going to connect the two houses because they had to be. Oh, right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah, okay. that's right. That goes back. And then, but no, then they came with, yeah, with the um, dimensional averaging. They fit within that, and so they came forward. Um, and then there was a the house at the top of Adair and Prospect um, that generated some community discussion. Well, <laughs> some voices. Right, right. Community. Feedback. But feedback, but that had nothing to do with the zoning either. That was a lot that was um, created well before the <coughs> size changed. Um, so then I have some of those in, in sort of examples, and I thought I would just run through these um, quickly. So these are examples. This is the Phillips Place project that um, where there was this um, existing two-unit building, which is in that picture um, on the left. And then another building was added, and it's the one on the, I don't know if I can get this mouse to work. Right here was another two <coughs> units. So that sort of filled in this gap over here. Um, and then this is the Grove Street. And you can stop and, I, you know, I'm just running through these, but if you have questions yeah. or whatever. Um, Grove Street, this is a single family house, sort of dilapidated, um, and this came through for site plan approval for um, four units in two separate buildings, and this is sort of the modern uh, right. building um, yeah. project that you guys approved right there in the corner of Grove and um, Laurel, I guess I should say. Uh, and that, if you I should go back. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is hard to, I think in several of these, um, the existing landscape was preserved um, to some extent. So you can kind of see these mature trees at the front are still there in the corner of this picture here, which, you know, they're different seasons, so it's hard to tell. But I think that um, seems to help allow those new structures to sort of fit um, right. um, into their, into their <coughs> This is the Day Avenue project, so it was a single family home. And then there were three buildings of single units each added because it was a, quite a deep lot. That's the one that you reviewed just the, as a the fence. for the fence and the landscaping mm -hmm. in the back just a mm -hmm. couple meetings ago. Mm -hmm. So that's the finished site for that one. Still, the vegetation, it was not a good summer for the vegetation to grow back. Um, it's ugly. But again, you know, the zoning doesn't address all that Aesthetics, level of detail right. of design, except for that covered front entry. Um, and this is the two family that was converted to a three. So <coughs> no exterior changes really for the most part, but they were just out, able to add a third. Where's unit. that one? That's on Day Avenue also. Um, and then this is down on Old South Street, uh, an A&R. This is a single family house. Mm -hmm. You probably recognize this. Mm -hmm. It's the new house that got built there in that mm -hmm. barn. Um, this is another A&R, single family. So it was a single family house. They had extra land. They carved off mm -hmm. another lot. And um, that's the house that was built. That's a lot of house in, oh. in, a, you know, in a small footprint. Yeah. Where is that one? That's on Massasoit. I will say that when it was going up, I was horrified, but it 
fit in better yeah. after it got sort I had of felt the same. Settled. I drove by it and I did a double. It was yep. like, that just that's too much too too much too soon after yep. the zoning changes. And then it and then it was put together and it's I think it's I think it's nice. Yeah, I, it's still I just, a big house. It is a big house, but I drove down the other day, kind of looking for it, intending to look, and missed it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it, it just fits the rhythm yep. of the street. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so this is another A and R. This is up in Leeds. This corner lot. Um, no, it will. <laughs> it's for sale. It is. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's a, yeah, that's a very nice. Yeah, they did a really so nice job. So it was built on spec to, to sell. No, somebody was in it for about a year. Oh. Okay. And, then, and, I, and then all of a sudden, and then just recently, a for sale sign went up. So I think someone was in it for about a year. I think we walk by it all the time. Um, this is on North Main Street in Florence. There was a fire on this part. It was a two. Oh year right, year. yeah, where they were and they, yeah. Yeah. So then now they're two. two. Um, Oh, there was a single family. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But it was a larger lot. Yeah. Right, it was a double. Yeah. <coughs> double something or, yeah. Um, yeah, well, once the zoning changed, it right. became a double right. lot. Mm -hmm. Right. And one's occupied, and I think one's for sale. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is up in Lee's, actually, sort of across the street from the other one. Yep. Um, again, an A&R <coughs> lot division <coughs> on this parcel here. Yeah, it's a very small. Well, where that house burned down and they've just torn it down, there's another small lot there as well. Right. On oh, on North Main. Yeah. Uh huh. And this is the Hatfield block that uh, came yeah, that's in. That's going up. Oh yeah, that's. Now it's good. It's four lots, eight units, and I think it's even more advanced beyond this picture that yeah. I took oh, yeah. a little it's while ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, it but that fills in. Obviously, you can see how that fills in that yeah. corner. Marco's got uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, can, my wife was asking me <laughs> because oh you're on the planning board don't you know this um, would there have been a particular like would they have sequenced it because of the shape it, it seemed like they built uh, it was just kind of odd how they built they built two and then they had one back here would, would they have done it because of like logistics and how tight the spacing was yeah I wasn't paying attention too much though I did on the times I've driven by it it seemed like it was like a hopscotch thing. right yeah generally when you do that it's because you, you have to back your way out of the site for, oh, for equipment okay. or concrete trucks or whatever. Right, and, and I remember it, well, yeah, it was a very tight and kind of an odd yeah. shape. But if you did these first, you'll never get to the one back okay. there, so you have to kind of. Hmm. So this one, I mean, like the other ones with the A&Rs, um, where it was sort of nestled into an existing neighborhood, this one was sort of right on the corner, and you might not think, it, it just kind of sort of sits out in the middle of nowhere, but, um, you know, it's a half a mile to the rail trail. Mm -hmm. um, Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area is within half a mile um, down Hatfield Street. Jackson Street School is within half a mile. And then there's the whole Big Y Plaza there. So it's a very accessible, I mean, even though there, there's, um, by pedestrian routing, it may be a little tricky. You have to go probably all the way down to a signal <coughs> because that Hatfield Street intersection is so difficult. But the proximity to all of those things, um, you might not realize just sort of looking at that in, a, in out of context. The thing you notice about that, however, is how close to the street it is. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, the one in the corner. Yeah, yeah. the one on the corners, and, and they are up toward the street considerably more than the houses that are in in line with them. I mean, I'm. Yeah, I mean, you can see the upper picture. The houses aren't that far set back, even no, the existing they're not, right. but it's still very obvious. Yeah, yeah. they're right to the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any? Um, so if you were there, how would you get to? It would, is the only way to get to Jackson Street to go down Bridge and then over, or is there a back? Well, you can go on the rail trail. So if you go down Hatfield Street, you'd hit the rail the trail, trail, and yeah. you can oh, go that's that true. way. That's true. Or Prospect is. Um, you know the just the next street over, over and there's right. a back door, door. entrance well, that's, yeah, Jackson Street, there is. Okay, which is probably yeah. shorter right. than going and that um, way you wouldn't have to go yeah. along the road yeah. right yeah. and I can pull up Google Earth too so we can look at that stuff but um, yeah probably you'd go by the um, nursing, nursing home. home and then tuck into that neighborhood because right. there's a quick okay. those those neighborhoods there have sort of a back door to the school there's sidewalk issues over there though right but they're also um, 
that once you get into the smaller streets, yeah. there's some dead end streets that dead end into the schoolyard. Yeah. Yeah. There are yeah. that, that, that street. Does that's have my old neighborhood. That's where I grew up. Oh right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we talked about that as being a way to drop off when we were dealing with traffic. Uh -huh. right. um, so then this is um, I just sort of for context wanted to bring this up compared to the Bridge Street. This is a slightly larger parcel than the um, Bridge Street. Hatfield intersection lots. Um, it's 52,000 square feet versus 48,000 square feet, and um, you know, comparable number of units. This was a single family home. So I drew these circles to show, and that, let me just pull in Where the. Where are we? So that, do you see the arrow down here? Oh God, yeah. There's this little square here. That's the Hinkley Street project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The blue circle uh, represents a half mile radius from Florence Center. So very close to Florence Center, and obviously you can see the high school down here. Um, you know, within a half mile, this green ring is a mile. Mm -hmm. So um, from Florence Center, so it's just outside of the half mile ring. Um, you have Smith Vocational's walkable, the high school, the Mill River trails are all within um, half mile. Mainsfield, the rail trail is even. You can see the rail trail up here. Um, cuts right through um, the middle there. I understand. What's the significance of those facts? Um, I'm just, so for the context of where the site is, there was, a con there's, there was lots of discussion about whether this was too much infill, if it's not the right location for infill, if we've gone over the top. So I think the concept is that the reason why we've looked at the zoning changes in these neighborhoods is because there's existing infrastructure, there's easy um, walkable access to goods and services in schools, and that's where we want to allow and facilitate new residential development because the infrastructure is already there to serve it. Um, and so I, I think there wasn't necessarily this context, particularly <coughs> talking about this picture, but I think we can look at any of the other examples that I have on the slideshow to think about that same context. Um, and, and also, uh, there was discussion during the hearings about whether, you know, that neighborhood is different, uniquely different from any other neighborhood, and therefore it shouldn't be treated the same as sort of the, the flavor of the, some of the conversation or comments that um, I was picking up. So, that's why I thought it was important to sort of look at the larger context um, and for you all to think about it in that sense as opposed to project by, by project right. or, or little block by block. So, um, and this is in a sense against my interest given the way I voted, but I mean, I, I think that is an, an interesting point, <coughs> or maybe it's a, a counterpoint, but I mean, you can, to me, you can make the argument given the size and scale of Northampton, you know, you could make this same drawing and, and, and argument almost anywhere. I mean, given where the bike path goes, given where schools are, I mean, which would say, well, then in this you know, infill works everywhere. But you could also say, well, given the size and scale of Northampton, there are neighborhoods that maybe are for this, I mean, kind of the counter, I mean, I think you can make the argument either way, but. Well, I, I think some of the, so I had to recuse myself from this one, so I didn't vote on it. But I think some of the arguments against that from, from the neighbors were, we get infill, we appreciate infill, but our neighborhood isn't right. an infill candidate. And right. I think what this shows is, is it is. Right, yeah, and I, well, and I think. If you're a half mile I, I walk you, to the center of town, and, right. and then you are. In yeah, and you could almost make that in, in anywhere in, in Northampton, I mean, within a reason, in almost anywhere in Northampton. They almost make both arguments. Right, both right, in some ways, yeah. But I think the other piece of that, making the argument in a lot of different neighborhoods, um, also um, indicates that where there will be some of these projects is going to be dispersed because there right. are lar there are right. opportunities yes. in so many locations. Right. right. So it's not all going to be concentrated in one neighborhood or another. Right. right. Yeah. <coughs> there and are so many strange pieces of property in Northampton mm -hmm. because of the long development and because of the hills and mm -hmm. other things that 
things are tucked back in places where they provide an opportunity that you don't necessarily even notice, particularly from the street. And, and it, is, it is distributed around equally distance, but distributed around. Right, so I think, I guess, um, you know, I really, I sort of um, thought this might be um, just, again, as I said, a jumping off point for the conversation, and we could definitely, you know, on your direction, we could certainly have interns in our office go and pull all the <coughs> records and get um, a more comprehensive sense of how many units have been created since the zoning. That initial list that I showed you um, were, you know, took not that much time for me to come up with. Um, I'm not sure that necessarily there's double that list when we send the interns out to go look at that, mm -hmm. but um, I think it gives you a sense of sort of the sprinkling of numbers in, in different neighborhoods, and they're different scales, and we've had sort of two bigger pro uh, well I wouldn't even necessarily call this a bigger project but the Bear Street project is 13 units and of course Shaw's is 12 but um, that's also in a different zoning district and right next to downtown. Mark? Could you have the uh, interns produce a map such as this for for future infill projects to give us context when yeah. when uh, you know notes from the, the board <coughs> internally when you send out staff recommendations or whatever if we had a contextual I think that map would have been helpful in the Hinkley Street discussion mm -hmm. um, I, I yeah, think it probably comes in two levels there's the a house on a double lot that you can say that's that's a good candidate but then there's the other where if the house comes down then it's a double you know so right. I mean I think it, it's a little more tricky than it sounds. No, I agree. And then like for here for Hinkley you could say you are a candidate for for infill, but then but then you take it a step further and you could say okay, there's infill 2 units and there's infill 8 units. And what just because we're a candidate for 8 for infill does that mean we have to cram it with as many units as possible or and then you but it's a different level of discussion than either yes or no. Right. So for me it is it, you know we're going to always hear from the neighborhood that they're distinct and different. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the reason that I'm comfortable with the zoning that we've arrived at is because two things. One is I want to get the most out of our infrastructure that we can. So if we've got water and sewer and, you know, utilities already running through a neighborhood, <coughs> it, I'm not rebuilding them. And we, we could right. we could... I don't have to say, but there are several we, we could talk about that you had to just completely restructure the infrastructure to have the development. Um, and the other is transportation. I mean, I think we're in a really arbitrary time of transportation when gas is $2 a gallon. And we've got an obese, an obesity problem. And so for many reasons, I'd like to see, that, those are my two main ones, is infrastructure <coughs> and transportation. Um, and you know, I, th I think we'll get to the point tonight where we are talking about the different zoning categories, and that to me is how you distinguish one type of neighborhood from another. Right. And this idea that there is an existing pocket of a neighborhood that needs to be protected as it is is a hard argument, but we're always going to hear it. I mean, that's that's inevitable. But isn't isn't there provisions within the regulations? There's, you know the protection or, or taking into account the character or negative impacts. Right. And I feel like we're just a rubber stamp organization. You know, we deal with everything at the fringes. Many things that really don't, in, in a large context, I don't think really matter in, a, in the big scale of things. From the standpoint of a neighborhood, a bike rack, a couple of trees, they're important and it's good, but that's where we put all of our time uh -huh. these little details and I think it is bigger than that I think it is but I think structure and transportation people don't it's un about people's quality of life and disruption to a, a historical context of a neighborhood is as you know you, you're taking it you saying, well that's done this your history is gone you have a new history it's the future that's great but you know, we don't have to go in everywhere 
and screw it up for the sake of this, I mean, these are great, I, I'm not arguing that these aren't good agendas, but they're not the only agendas. And I, th I think what I hear from people is that, you know, we are a rubber stamp board and everything that comes to us, and granted, it's pretty well laid out for us to be a rubber stamp board, but that part of the, the evaluation where we take into account people's concerns and needs and the aesthetics and all of those other things, we have, we have an opportunity and we consistently don't take it, in my opinion. And that's, that's where I'm having, that's why I have issues. And I mean, a lot of these, for the most part, I think have worked out. I, I think this one in particular is, is a, a, a mistake. Well, I would say when, when you're talking about doing things on the perimeter, I think it's not well understood what is the scope of control that we have to work with. I mean, if someone is coming in uh, and they own a piece of property and they want to do what the zoning says it could, but there's some distinction, that's it, it, it's hard for me to make to, to receive the community's interest in saying no, nothing should happen there. That's what they really want. And so I think it comes more nuanced than we're just about shrubbery. I really do. I think um, I think it depends on whether it is a site plan or a special permit. That, that's the that's the big issue. When, on site plan, we're very restricted, and a lot of it ends up only talking about shrubbery and bike racks because that's all <coughs> that we can talk about. But at Hinkley, for instance, that was a special permit uh, discussion, and we ha had the opportunity. If you, uh, like the Cumberland Farms at the corner of Main Street in Florence. Mm -hmm. They came in and they met everything, zoning and setbacks and everything uh, that they needed to, but that was a special permit discussion and we thought as a board, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. And we thought it shouldn't be there. A 24 hour light up neon sign should not be in the center of Florence. That's not what wants to be there from a massing standpoint. From a and it ended up with that new development, which I think everybody, you know, I wish somebody was in that development or, or more people were in there, but um, is exactly what the center of Florence wanted. And so the board could have argued on Hinckley Street that where we had the opportunity to recognize the concerns of the neighborhood and so forth, because that special permit discussion allowed us to have that. Um, ah, but remember, the way the zoning was such, the site plan would have allowed for the same density on that unit if it hadn't been designed in the way it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I, that, that may be the crux of what we want to talk about tonight, if this is the, the, the one piece where you think it's, it's most uh, obvious that the zoning is leading it in a different direction. But I really think we are going to need to lead in a different direction. I'm, I, I have lived over in Bay State. I mean, I, I understand the neighborhood, not that street. Um, and I, but, but I, um, I think we will always hear those same arguments from the neighbors, actually. That's what I've had to adjust to over the years. Um, well, I think if I could just add, you do have the language and special permit, as you talked about, about um, character. There's also in site plan about the fitting into the context. I think the applicant in this particular instance um, argued that how they felt they met that context. You may have disagreed, which is fine. You, you know, you can use your vote that way. I don't think that means necessarily that the board rubber stamps or doesn't hear the neighbors. I think that they're hearing, I think the board hears the applicant side, they hear the resident side, and they look <coughs> at it from a bigger picture perspective. And so it may feel like to the residents they're not being heard, but that's not what's happening. Um, so, and I know I've heard from people saying that the planning board just rubber stamps everything um, as well. So I don't, I'm, I, I agree with your assessment. That's what people are saying. Some people are saying. But I also, you do have that language in the ordinance, and I think you do use it judiciously. Um, and Mark, I think you pointed out a good example of that. I, I would like to add that sometimes when we have people here, I try to make a point of clarifying what it is we actually have the capacity to do. And I think it's it might be useful as we 
take on these projects to have that be <coughs> a piece of information front on so that people's expectations for what it is we really are able to do um, are out there in front and can be can be balanced against what it is they would like. I mean, if we are unable to prevent something from happening, it, it does no good for them to come up and say, the only thing I really want you to do is not permit anything to happen here or some equivalent kind of thing, which occasionally does occur. But there are other things where they want us to do things that we really, we can't. And I think getting it out there early and making it clear is probably at least marginally helpful. Um, and and then could just become a piece of the <coughs> way we do business. Yeah. Here's the broad concept of what it is we are able to do, and you know, not beyond that. Well, th I think one of the interesting things about this project is that, you know, I think uh, you were just alluding to that. I think that through approval not required, the applicant could have carved out four lots and done two units per. And I, I did hear a couple of times from a couple of different people in the audience that they would be okay with six units, not eight. So then you're left with, if you determine, if you look at that as a board, what is it about six and eight that somehow is, it works for the neighborhood and still fits within your jurisdiction? I mean, what is it about those two extra units? Is it the design? Is it just that it feels like maybe two extra cars it would be too much so that becomes a complicating a complicated thing for you all to evaluate and um, it's at that point you know it's it's a couple of people's opinion that they would feel okay with this number but not this other number uh, it was alluded to in the presentation that there had at one point possibly been even two more units designed mm -hmm. on that and that Right, he said that in response to the neighborhood, he exactly. reduced it. Yeah. To eight. And, and so I thought that was a listening to the neighborhood there. That's and a, it's also a good strategy. It was, and I thought, thought that got him back to the uh, same density as would have been allowed by Wright. So all of that is, is new, you know, it's a complicated story to work your, your way through with, you know, a very, um, a, a room full of people. I mean, you know, that's that's what that was. Um, I think th at the issue is not that particular piece of property. Um, I think it's what has us here talking tonight. But do we as a board have a feeling that there should be special consideration for certain neighborhood densities that are different now than they would be if the zoning continued to have its effect? So one of the things about the zoning that happens is we're already dense enough that you don't get big wholesale turnover of areas. Um, I happen to like modern design, so I'm not bothered by the range of what these new places look like. What I, what I like about them is that they look different, that we, we planted different unique new houses around in town. So, you know, that, but that, uh, that feels good to me. That doesn't feel like, uh, you know, uh, we've, put a subdivision on the perimeter of town. That's what really I concerns me. Um, um, and we have in some cases, you know, my hope is that we've got enough of the infrastructure there to support it. But I'd really like to have the discussion is, you know, underneath this zoning, are there special pockets of residential uh, concern that we should, we should look at differently? Well, let me, it's on Hinkley. Um, Let's say hypothetically there was another lot available. A d developer would come in, could come in and make the exact same argument, right? So then there'd be eight more units on the same street. It could be right next door, hypothetically. Right. So we, and, and I guess we couldn't say no, really. No. And that's one of, one of the arguments that they made, you know, is the developer comes in, knocks the house down, and you know, and then you, you fundamentally change the character of an entire neighborhood. And I think that's, that's a significant concern. And I think the other thing that's different, I mean, a lot of the, you know, neighbor, the neighbors don't like change. There's no question. We had a, an entire room full of people, and we sat through hours of discussion. And in the end, 
we basically told everybody to go pound. And to me, I mean, if, if you've got someone on your left and someone on your right who's not happy with what you're doing, that's one thing. But when you have an entire neighborhood come down, I really feel like we, we did miss an opportunity to take into account the community, which I think is <coughs> as important as <coughs> the planning department's goals or, or even our individual personal objectives. And I think that's what we missed on this. My question, though, like, like I hear what you're saying, but I feel like that argument, like Devin said, anybody at any one of these projects could make that statement, and that's impossible for us to then decide, you know, that Day Ave is, you know, has a special unique character that, you know, we have to exert more, you know, sort of control over it. Like it's, you know, every, every abutter is going to say that. I mean, the, the other piece of it is that at the end of the day, like we are talking about development. It's not our land that we own. Like we're talking about, you know, revenue generating units that are at the end of the day good for the city you know it's good for people to be paying more property taxes and have you know stormwater fees and like this is that is that's the purpose of development and that's why there's planning regulations for us to talk about it's not our starting point isn't you know everything that's here in this moment of course not is protected but it just feels like i don't see what was so unique you know i've i spent time going through that neighborhood on Hinkley a lot going up and down those streets and I just don't see what I could justifiably say was different about that pocket or that cluster of stuff than some of the other parts of town where this has happened like it just didn't feel it it, it didn't feel different in that sense right but but we don't live there and I guess the, the thing well, is that's my right I mean that's <laughs> they do but and we so live, and we all live somewhere though that's my point true, but like you, but, but <laughs> I didn't go and you know and we didn't have a whole lot of people come on Massasoit to say oh my god how can you do this we had you know two you know a couple of neighbors right a butters really and this was different. Hinkley was, was absolutely different. We had an entire neighborhood out in force. I think that it's not an all or nothing that, that you know, I understand what the, you know, the purpose of the planning board is and that we're development and we're growing and, right. and the, you know, population's growing. We need to find a place for people. There's no question about that. But we need to do it in a way that is measured. And that's just my, my sense of that. And I think a framework to somehow, you know, it's not so much how do you identify whether a neighborhood is special. That's not for us to determine. There is nothing that we can say, oh, this is a special neighborhood because, you know, five out of the eight of us like it. It's somehow how do we deal with and evaluate what we get for feedback from, a, from the local community? Is there a framework that we can evaluate and, and be able to say, you know what, this this can't go forward as it is. It, it needs to be six. Yeah, I've got thoughts on that, but Anne? Well, to back away from the personal and get into a, a sort of more analytic, not that the personal isn't right sitting there with you all the time, because it is. One of the th things when you look at this is to look to see, as we overlay the districts on the city, did we misidentify some kinds of places and that's not personal to any particular <coughs> place but rather there are always edges and there are always places where um, as you take a second or third look and see the way development occurs you can see that you know this ought to be moved in some direction or that ought to be moved in another and as part of what we're doing here I think it would pay to take a look at how we defined some of those areas just to be sure that so it feels yeah. consistent with the kinds of development that's going on. And maybe that makes a difference in some of these neighborhoods, although I don't yeah. know th that that um, would be the case here. I, th I think back on Phillips Place and that neighborhood was equally as uh, clear that that development didn't belong there. It, it was so much closer to downtown, I felt really good about doing that and I think it's a nice looking 
um, outcome, but I have had, even within the last month, someone accost me in town and say, I remember you did that, we didn't want it done. And so I'm not sure how, you know, whether a neighborhood is organized in presenting its problems is one thing, or and some are more organized than others. And I think as you look down that street, there are large lots, and that's what they want to protect. And I, I'm coming back to that sort of British common good. I mean, there is the immediate neighbor that it's not good for. Nobody wants the building, the noise, the traffic, you know, those changes are changes. I get that. But there is the, as Tess was sort of referring to, the the town good that we're not, we're, we're presenting that piece of it. You know, what's, what are we trying to get out of controlled development over time that adds residential stock to the town? Um, I went back through the, uh, tax rate for uh, the last six years in half a dozen towns, and we've got to, we, we look good on that list. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Amherst is 2122 a thousand, and, and we're 1616. Uh, so there are things that we are doing that are helping that, com that outcome be that way. Um, Mark. So I think I, I get where you're coming from. I just don't know how, the, how you could regulate that Unless when we, this exercise, I think, is an attempt to make sure there's no outlying, you know, a pocket of potential density that wasn't intended, yeah. you know, because it's because right now the zoning it's not as tight as it should be. Um, That's what I was. Right, and so I think if through this we 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 clean things up if if things need cleaning up, um, but this for whatever reason this was the first, and I asked Carolyn to see if she could find the zoning map to see if Hinkley Street if that property was an outlier because I don't think it was um, and so I don't you know we've had eight ten infill projects and everyone for the most part we've said that was the intent of infill feel good about that one and then Hinkley came up and that caused pause <coughs> so what what was different about Hinkley if it wasn't an outlier if it was where we wanted density to happen then then what caused so many people to show up and voice against it, what caused so much consternation in the, in the on the board? Yeah, and I would just caution as well that in, as opposed to, I don't think your job is to go in and determine based on the number of people that have been gathered here because they have social media connections, right. that all of a sudden that becomes the important neighborhood to protect versus other neighborhoods that maybe don't have that same kind of connectivity. Um, and that's your job is to sort of look objectively at the city and what the goals and objectives are for um, sustainable development going forward, you know, our footprint reductions and looking at where it makes sense um, to allow some, um, some development that um, will occur. So I think I can't, because of the network connectivities, I can't jump to the zoning map, but I just have to <coughs> zoom in a little bit on this map, and then you can yes, hand that one around. You can pass that one around, and um, we can talk about that. Um, but you know, I, the other piece that this discussion was had during the rezoning process: well, how much is this going to? You know, how many units are we really going to see in the city? Want. And when we did a really rough analysis, we looked at so the infill parcels. We had to discount possibilities of teardowns and rebuild because, number one, it's not there's not a big demand in the city for there's not so much pressure for development that people are coming in and tearing down houses because the values are so high on the you know on the development end. That's what it was. Um, but it was really below five percent, one percent to five percent, sort of total increase in number of units by district. Um, and so it's hard to... Over how long, Carolyn? Oh, at any, you know, for forever. I mean, basically, we don't, we haven't seen the growth that many, that number of units who are sort of a slow, modest growth community. I don't know what just happened here, but... Um, and... Uh, and so we looked at that. Now this was, I would say this is a unique situation in that this was a dilapidated house. You saw the dilapidated house on Grove yeah. Avenue. Yeah. That was another teardown for yeah, four units. Yeah. Um, so yes, it, there, there are 
there is older housing right. stock where it makes sense that's beyond repair and investment, reinvestment. Um, but those, I think, are far and few between. So in this case, this happened to be a slightly larger lot, and the house was in such a deteriorated shape that it didn't make sense to I'm just look I'm trying to. Uh, but if you look at the other <coughs> lots in the neighborhood, they're much <coughs> smaller than this lot. So, you know, I don't, I think the argument that all of a sudden the neighborhood's going to change because anybody can come in and tear down a house um, doesn't really match with the economic reality of and the cost of development um, and the opportunities. So this was a slightly larger lot, but if you look on the blocks below that, those are smaller lots that match sort of if you sort of look all around the map they're kind of pretty consistent with um well, that's sort of like a pattern recognition exercise but it doesn't look like to me that it's a whole street that's distinctly different than right. the neighborhood no. i just want to mention back to where dan started about the the operating at the edges i completely agree that we do i, I mean you know i mean in the time we've been on you know that that yeah i mean i can certainly say I guess I've always approached it as hopefully we we see it as we're here to hopefully have the best version of whatever is permitted. And that is often just that, you know, doing the hair, doing the there, doing the trees, you know, things like that. Um, because, and, and then go to the Hinkley specifically for me, you know, I, I started with, okay, what was he allowed to do? He, you know, he never even would have had to come to us. What did he want to do? And at least for me, and this just might be my own, I thought what he wanted to do was a better version than what he could have done without asking anybody. I mean, that was just my own, I, you know, I just thought there's more thought going into this than going into that. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to do that, but, and so that's where, you know, I felt, I felt we'd had the opportunity actually to improve it. Something was going to happen with that lot. You know, the house was coming down, whatever, and I, and I guess that was where, you know, I thought this was a better version of what was going to happen than what he could have done without asking anybody. But, but I completely get that, yeah, it does seem like all we're here to do is kind of agree with them. <laughs> right. We don't have as much, and, and not, you know, I have just the opposite. I, in fact, I had some neighbors stop me the other day and say, well, why, and I'm like, you know, we don't, you know, we just can't, like, tell people what to do. You know, right. if they follow the rules, they can pretty much, you know, they just got to follow the rules. But what, I mean, what you just said, though, has the kernel of it, which is what's allowed, what's allowed right. is horrible. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In my well, I don't know horrible, but yes, but I, I understand. The outcome saying, would have yes. been yes. much worse, and you know it, that seems to me to be sort yeah. of not really. There's not the discretion from the get go, almost. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think where you've exercised discretion, and you and the city council and everyone who participated in the public conversation is that the zoning has gotten very specific because the hard work was done up front <clears> to say. We want to do it because people in the community said we don't want to just allow building anything you want and then a, a vo you know an open special permit process where anybody can throw anything at the board and the board's thinking, well, do I go with this guy's thoughts or this other person's thoughts? And it has it's double edged. I mean, developers need to know what the community wants. So you've done a lot of that hard work up front by crafting the zoning to be very specific. So anything over seven units requires a lot more than it ever did before. There's, there has to be, you know, um, open space area. The units have to be situated in a way that sort of matches the context of the neighborhood. They're, all, they're very specific criteria that they that each project, especially when it's a special permit project like this one, so you've done a lot of that work, which maybe makes it seem like it's a rubber stamp, but you've set it out there for the whole community to see. If you want to do this, this is what you have to do. And so everyone knew going in, even before city council voted on it, these were the criteria. Um, and and it's that was done coming on the heels of this overall plan for the city to be more aware and more sustainable about how we grow and allowing people and, and creating housing opportunities that were smaller and different and accessible and then didn't require people to get in their cars for every single trip that they're making and 
all of that. So that led to this zoning. So you guys have done a ton of that work ahead of time. I'm not sure that <clears throat> um, thinking about this whole infrastructure issue, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I agree that it's valid. I suspect I would be surprised if every of the every one of the units they're going to build on Hankley Street wouldn't have at least one car, if not two, even though they could ride their bikes. Um, the fact that they're near the bike path, you know, they may people may go for a walk, they may ride their bike. I live out on Leeds and the very last street in Northampton. I ride my bike all the time. You don't have to be near the bike path or downtown. As a matter of fact, riding your bike downtown is terrible, um, unless you're on a bike path. Um, <clears throat> I try. I do everything I can to avoid it. Um, I <laughs> people on Hinkley Street. I mean, in, unless somebody is actually living downtown, it's really in this society you're going to have a car. If you, if you choose to live downtown, it may one of the reasons might be to avoid having a car. But once you get out of the immediate downtown area, I suspect that it's an illusion. Um, but I don't think the argument was that people wouldn't, the infrastructure argument wasn't that they might not have cars, it's that there are already roads and water connections and gas connections and you know I mean well, the, the full suite of development infrastructure it's not a green true field. everywhere though where is that well, it's not, not I mean it's because this is infill I mean we're talking about if we were to go to the outskirts of Northampton and don't have to build roads or or put in sewer lines and water lines first of all the city won't do it second people build houses out there have to have a septic and a and a well um, but that's less sustainable than um, I don't know if it's less sustainable. The water comes from the same place. <clears throat> um, the I'm, I'm not sure there's a difference. The, the argument isn't necessarily that people aren't going to own cars, but it is trending that people are not having two cars per household. But the idea is that you have the opportunity to take some of your trips. You don't have to necessarily go out to eat in Florence Center by driving. You could walk or bike there instead of getting in your car to go. So out of all the, the 10 trips that you might take as a, in, a, in your household, not, maybe not every single one of them will be in your car because you're so close to these other things that you don't need to That's rely. Okay, I, I, understand. I, I agree with that. Occasionally that will happen, but at a cost of changing the entire neighborhood for those people who live there. So what is the better good? I'm not sure. Though I, though I would... The, the changing the entire neighborhood, uh, that, that's one, because I think we hear that a lot. Well, maybe that's an overstate. Well, but, but, I, but we hear it a lot. I mean, not, I, don't, I don't mean just, I mean, I, we hear it from out there a lot. And, and, and I, you know, I know we've heard it when we've had projects up on Prospect Street or, uh, and, and Round Hill Road. And, and, and I guess, to me, that doesn't, to me, in some ways, that's the least, the least of the arguments, because before those houses were there, they built those houses, and that changed the nature in the neighborhood. You know, I mean, so you can't say, well, we, we're going to stop changing the neighbor, nature of the neighborhood after I change it. I mean, I guess that, you know, for some of you, know, it's a, you buy in. You know, you buy into a community, and the community is the entire town, not just one small part. And I mean, that's, you know, and I know we've heard that a lot from, from up on uh, Round Hill Road and stuff, you know, people move in they're like, okay, I moved here and I want to stay exactly like this. Well, that's, that, that's just not that's, just that's not the way the world works. Mark, this might just be an instance where we spent 18 months looking at zoning. It went through, came back, went out, went back. It was, it was only 18 months or whatever it was. <laughs> and then it was implemented and we gave it our best shot and 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 for the most part, if not entirely, it, it's worked the way we intended. This particular property for whatever reason it's it's resonated with yeah. people but you look at it and you can say objectively you know, it's a half mile from this it's a quarter mile from that this wants to be an infill project so then what's then why are we still talking about it and maybe it's because it's eight units instead of six right. and so so then you dig deeper and say well is the magic number seven anything over seven requires so we haven't tweaked we spent 18 months implementing it took a long time we haven't tweaked anything what if we what if we in this instance pull it back a little bit and make the magic number six instead of seven. 
So people are coming to us and for five and six units, not seven and eight. And then so allowed by right is, is less appealing. I mean, not, uh, not less appealing, but That's less hard. daunting or whatever to the neighborhood. And, and maybe that's just a little. Well, I think to get to, to your concern, the solution would ha not be let's define this as a separate neighborhood. I think the solution would be, as Mark's hinting, let's talk about whether there is some refinement to the zoning and we change the underlying structure right. that allowed this to happen. Right. Um, but I think there's one piece we haven't mentioned here, and that is that. You know, um, I backed away from a building project because building costs are just so high right now. And so we, you know, the planning office is, and, and us, we're trying to hit a balance between uh, getting a developer to be interested in doing a project that they can make some money on or they wouldn't be doing it, and having the, 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 the Housing the rules work for them. And housing that people need. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we've really done a lot in bringing the, the how, how do our rules look? Like, what what, do you, what are you able to do? I think we, I, I feel really good about that. Um, I think if, if uh, this project, I, I still, I don't get a different look from that street than I do most of Bay State, frankly. Um, but if we think that there is, and we think, we, I mean, I'm, we, we could open that discussion, but I feel like we shouldn't do it just casually because we had no. one tough project, because I think we did go through 18 months. And right, but I, th I think I, there's certainly some logic in thinking <coughs> we, we landed on seven as being the magic number, but maybe maybe we, weren't, we were wrong, and this might bring more Do you more really think six is different than seven in every instance because no piece of property is going to be identical, six is going to fit lovely on some, seven I agree. might fit. It's so I don't know that it might have been the magic number, I'm not saying, for this piece of property, but I can't imagine that. Uh, I think all it would do is bring more projects in front of us if the, right. if the number was lower, which would give us as a board more opportunity. If it was special permit, which allows that discussion, and it, and it came in front of us more often because the lumber number was lower, that would just give us more opportunity to 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 say You're that doesn't mean we have to. But I'm missing why it would come. Wouldn't the six have been permitted by right? But, and so, but, but, the density right, would have but you been could exactly the you same. You could have argued six by right is different than eight by right. It would have been six instead of eight, right? right. No, it, if we had lowered it to six, yes. they would have gotten. But we heard arguments from the neighborhood that we're okay with six, right. eight is four. family in right. that zone. Two case. questions. Yeah. Wasn't when we were doing the, the zoning um, updates and having all the meetings, wasn't the original the original number, not seven, wasn't it ten or something? Wasn't it much? It was higher. Yeah, higher? it was. But, but yeah. And, uh, yes, that's yeah. true. Okay, so I, that was just a clarification. My other question, though, is, um, and I don't know if any of us here would have heard directly from any counselors, but has the planning office heard from any city counselors and wards where these types of infill developments have happened, either positively or negatively? Like, I know that, you know, I know in Ward 3, at Before least, you know, Ryan O'Donnell yeah. was very, you know, kind of engaged. She comes to a lot of the hearings. Mm -hmm. I don't know who the city councilor is here. Just, I'm sorry, because I don't, David but, Murphy. okay. Um, and I, I mean, have, have you heard anything? Has the city council a asked the question of should we revisit, mm -hmm. you know, the, the yeah. zoning? No. Hearing from constituents? The other thing may be layout. So, no, the answer is no. But so when the the applicant presented that they could do four unit four lots and do the same number of units, the organization and the access would have been um, mm -hmm. much worse in terms mm -hmm. of on, uh, access on the street. We only allow uh, common driveways to access three lots. So I don't know if if allowing more flexibility with access for properties that are close to the street, so for instance, emergency and fire personnel don't need to use a driveway to get to a place but can access from the street, would it make sense to expand the allowances for infill lots for shared driveways so that maybe in that regard you could create something that in the neighbor's mind looks more like what they're used to seeing right. yeah. um, well, that instead of one of the issues shared they, had, like, yeah. they yeah. thought it was like a <coughs> I think someone said the word compound or something mm -hmm. or complex like yeah. to them like that what that looked like you know and that was just a layout you know it maybe could have been 10 units in a different layout that would have been more palatable. 
it, it moved to the it moved houses to the back of the piece of property, which is more or less different than the row upon row of houses that are or at least on that side of the street. It was a hill on the other side. They were arranged a little mm -hmm. bit differently. Right. I mean, they had the two that created that sense mm -hmm. of row, but then there were two in the back. Yeah. So I, I, you know, that's another potential way to look at. It. Maybe it's the design. Maybe there's some tweaks of the design as opposed to the number of units. Um, mm -hmm that would allow a little more flexibility. I think there was general agreement that dividing up, having four driveways and individual lots would have been way worse. Right, that's what I'm saying. So if you, if the zoning allowed for a shared driveway to serve, oh. so you have still have one access, um, but it serves more than the three lots, which is the maximum allowed now. So it's for the houses going back in some way that they use a common or it could just go around to the back, almost like an alley or something along the oh. back, so the houses are pulled to the front. But, um, you know, there are probably a number of ways you could do it. So in that discussion, all of the structures were duplexes, but you could have a three-family zoning in that, in that, the zoning there would allow for three families. Right. So if that could have been divided into four lots, could we have had 12? I don't remember the lot size because you'd have to meet, um, okay. but you could certainly, I could, I could probably more readily see three lots with three families and that's nine. Um, so I mean, I think it sort of gets back to yours. What, you know, if we're trying to lay out the rules for what can happen, then we tried to think through all the permutations and, uh, you know, lots of, you know, lots of ways to, to because you can't really know what's going to get presented to you. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, um, it's a healthy discussion to have, and I, I'm not sure I see anything. I, have, I haven't heard anything that I really think is a whole lot better solution. I, um, I don't think the Hinkley Street will happen a lot. No, to your point, the, the density is such, at the very beginning when we, when we talked about this, I think you, you showed us a map and, you know, where is potential infill within, you know, a mile loop around the downtown or whatever, three mile loop, and it was pretty limited. Yeah. And so I don't think we're going to have this success discussion uh, often, but it might, when we have it, the more options we have, the better. Well, the other thing, so as part of maybe just taking another look at this, another crack, is maybe we could have someone pull up all the building and really just map it so that you can see the map of the entire city where these projects have happened mm -hmm. and maybe code it in a way that you can tell it's more than a single family, you know, less than 10 units or whatever like that. And then you can, then maybe you can come back to that discussion and say, does it seem like we're still on the right track? Well, I think in terms of allowances and where the right. you know um, where it's dispersed what about the, the raising you know, uh, question or concern that was raised I mean it I mean, just be, if there's only one percent or five percent that is available you really expand it if you start getting into well, well knock it down subdivide mm -hmm. boom off we go and then everything changes and mm -hmm. I don't know maybe that's maybe that's what we all want but is that some, is that a concern and that something that also needs to be addressed somehow? I'm, I don't know. I, I, again, sort of what we've heard is that um, that is a, a costly approach to development of a site. So if you do have, you know, a Shaw's Motel that's just beyond repair, then that's going to be a demolition. If you have a house that's not been maintained for I don't know how many years as the Hinkley Street, then that might be you know, those are more unique situations, I think, because we're not in that high demand market like the eastern part of the state where the returns are so high that mm -hmm. it makes sense to tear down. But to Dan's point, could someone do that? For, for set, set aside the economic argument, could would someone come in, buy a place, tear it down, and if, if the, you know, money right. was, you know. I mean, that's what the Hinkley Street project was. It's a demolition and, and rebuild, yes. And they did that on for the one on Grove Avenue as well. Um, and, so, could the, and Day. Yeah. Okay. But it doesn't mean the house has to be dilapidated. I mean, it could, they could come down and 
tear down the yeah, like day day after it was a it. They perfect, yeah. right. perfectly fine house. So, but they took that out. But if we, uh, it's just the extra cost of right. getting a good house instead of a crappy house mm -hmm. to start with. <laughs> to start with. Well, and I, there's I, no reason to think this is limited to Bay State, right? It could be right. anywhere. Yeah, right. I mean, all. No, what I was saying, the Grove Avenue. <coughs> one, example, right. That happened. Yeah. 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 There any any street anywhere in town that has a big lot or a huge backyard. Well, you need frontage, so yes, you, yeah. But then, I mean, you look at the one at, on South Street, that, that corner lot, which was one of the very first infill, if not mm -hmm. the first, in, and that seemed, that was perfect. That was exactly what was intended, you know, for that there should be a house in that pro on that piece of property, now there is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is still new. This, this, this is the first iteration, and, and, and the city's still getting used to it, so I think we just need to, I don't think we need to panic every time there's a room angry mob, a room full of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I but we need to be aware of why, why, this, right. why we're hanging on to this right. discussion. What is other, it? Even on South Street, it just happens that that was on a major thoroughfare and on a corner, so it didn't have a neighbor. And it was right. being built in front of a house that the applicant owned. Right. So that was an unusual, yeah. if that was that same situation in a normal street could have been the same thing. Mm. Or Grove. I mean, if you look at Grove um, Ave, that was that was unique development, but I think a a, a a right development. Well, there's one other piece of this. It's a really small gain, but you're, you know, we are a town of housing stock that's a hundred years old, and so we've changed our building codes and our you know solar capability. So, in some ways, that there is a sideline benefit to the town to put in properties that use a less that generate some of their own power and are better insulated and and <coughs> I don't know that there's enough to make that argument very strongly but I mean it, it is a, a factor so as you're talking about the day Avenue those are three solar as you're talking mm -hmm. about you know a lot of these properties they are so what do we want Carolyn to do we want her to inventory the map I say, let the interns loose. Yeah. <laughs> you never have too much information. <laughs> okay, we can get it mapped. Well, and I think you may have some. I wouldn't. I wouldn't start from scratch because I think that you worked very hard to make uh, graphics that were explanatory to what the zoning meant as we were developing them. And I'd like to look back through some of those and see, you know, um, what we should, you know. We're asking ourselves the question, did we do it? Did, did, are there revisions or tweaks that we need to make mm -hmm. to it? So I think we kind of ought to start at the base of where we were. Okay. And the let the interns loose story is not on open lots, but on lots that could be more dense than they are. Okay, so you want that as well as what's already been developed? Yeah, I think what's mm -hmm. been like this, I thought was helpful. Um, of, of, the, of the 10, you know, projects that you showed us, I would say that the board's either 9 for 10 or 10 for 10. As far as, not the board, but the, the, process. the, the, the process worked in those instances. And so, but if, if, if for those that have happened or those that are coming up, we had a similar map, an overview of here's the district, Right. Here's, it's in the middle of the district, it's right on the edge of the district, or it's within a half mile of downtown, or whatever it's gonna be, that would just inform our opinion so that when we're talking to neighbors, we can say, I get your point, but look, here's, this is where you are, this is what, right, right, step back and look. I don't know if that'll make any difference to anybody, really, um, because they still want their neighborhood preserved, they won't be influenced by the fact that from a plan, overall planning standpoint, it might, be justifiable. They, they and we can recognize whether we have consistency or not. But the, that right. might speak to the, the, the perception that this is just a rubber stamp. And at least they'll know why there's a stamp <laughs> on the plan is right. that it fits the model. Right, because right. The, model. the neighbors were arguing again that w we appreciate sustainable design, that the plan and infill is good. But our neighborhood is different. We're not downtown. We're not close to things. We're off in the, you know, out in the boonies, and it doesn't, it doesn't relate to us. And in actuality, it, it did. Right. And so, if we 
could have said, I appreciate what you're saying, but you're in the heart of this district. You're yeah. half a mile from this. My, they already know where they live. Yeah. I don't think. No, I know, but I don't know if the the board was. They know where they 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 live. They don't know the zoning map. You know, they don't know. They don't know this circle. You know, they don't. I, or, or they're just not paying attention. Right. Um, but that's just. I mean, not to down. You know, and that's. These are all important renditions views, perspectives, mm -hmm. but it's a perspective and it's a two-dimensional one. Right. And I think that's, you know, that's something else to, to consider is, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, all those circles are great and I get, I get all that, but, you know, r when you zoom in to there, well, what is it about that that maybe needs to have more consideration? And I'm, I'm not suggesting that we allow mob mentality to dictate what we do but that that there sh that there is there is a provision for us to look at is there a detrimental effect to a neighborhood i'm not sure that we have ever really applied it cuz i'm not sure we know how to apply that I, I think if we do we do it through tweaks to the zoning itself i don't think on a project by project basis that i feel like we can Dan, that's just, I want to I want to have the rules I'm working by. I want the rules to be known by the developer who's proposing the project. And I it, want to be able to try to explain them to the neighborhood. But uh, when the project itself comes before me, it's not the right time for me to think that we would, you know, I think of Phillips Place. That, you know, that neighborhood really didn't want that development there. I think it's a really nice looking thing I mean I, I it's in just fine. yeah a block from town so to speak but that had that had a rough process also I, I think you do have the ability to analyze whether there's something detrimental and uh, what the, whether there's an that's the language in the zoning it's a detrimental effect to the neighborhood I think that um, it requires a lot of information that points in that direction. I mean, let's take Barrett Street, for example. The neighbors um, <coughs> claimed that the water, um, surface water was so high that the, that the, the construction itself would have it, um, an, would impact the water table, will disperse the water in a way that would create flooding in basements, and that was the detrimental effect. Had the engineering um, evaluation also pointed to that, I think you could have easily said, you know what, the conditions of this site do, don't make this work. But you also get into a situation where you have people making claims, and then you have engineering studies that don't really fit, don't match those claims. So then you're put into a position, what do you do? Do you, you know, rely on the engineering reports, which you should, I would argue, but there are also then conditions that you could place to help the neighborhood feel like, A, you've heard what they said and you do have a concern about that and you want to make sure you apply something right. that has recourse in it so you can affect that. Now, some people might say, oh, you're just tweaking around the edges, but in fact, you're trying to get at, what, is that really going to have a detrimental effect? you maybe don't evaluate that it does, but you also want to sort of put extra tape on that to make sure that's true. Boundaries. Yeah. It's really hard not need to, to leave. think that the major issue with Hinckley Street was the houses that were set in the back, which gave a look that was very different and that they were having I can understand a hard time seeing how that fitted into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, that numbers one or two more, in my opinion, probably wouldn't have, or less, probably wouldn't have made any difference. Once you put a cluster development in the neighborhood, which essentially had a row of houses, you were creating a different look. Mm -hmm. And I think. I think it's that look that, as much as anything that was made it feel mm -hmm. alien. Well, and I think we could talk about that too as we do this next iteration of where the infills happen. I think I, I know that from sort of designing the zoning that the board and 
community members talked a lot about allowing different varieties of housing types to address gaps in our sure. housing um, inventory so that we have one stories, we have smaller units, mm -hmm. and you know, there's this whole cottage <laughs> housing movement that you, where you have shared land and there's smaller units and you're, it's more cost, it can be more cost effective that way. So that speaks to sort of the wanting to allow a little bit more flexibility, but yes, it is different. So mm -hmm. as a community, are we going to say we're still going to build the same way even though it's not meeting our needs or do we have to yes, but look is, and say yeah. we have energy problems, we have climate change problems, we need to think a little bit differently, we need to allow different types of housing to address needs of all people. You know, Dan, the point you make I think is valid about just being lines on paper and not just two dimensional and all, and we should be more um, open to input from the neighborhood and about how special the neighborhood is. On the other hand, I would hate to be sitting here and say, mm, you're not yelling quite loud enough, or uh, God, your, your neighborhood is kind of special, but not super special. Mm -hmm. right. It's, that's, that's tough. Well, that's yeah. kind of what I meant about right. the fact that I would yeah. rather the He's zone guide right. us. Right. Yeah. Right. We yeah. have to, I mean, <clears throat> to be able to exercise that much discretion and tell somebody that their neighborhood is nice, but not that nice. Um. <laughs> so I think we've we've um, we've sort of got some things. Thank you for being willing, being so nice about. It. Sure, we'll try that because um, it's a lot of work. But um, I think I think it's needed at this point for reassurance. Yeah, um, the interns are for exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to say the seven o'clock discussion of. Uh, planning related issues was had for an hour and a half and I think um, and it was good it was a good discussion yep. and that's why I said I thought that it's a, a great time for you to join us um, Carolyn you want to walk us through minutes or ANRs I, I can't remember how long ago I sent the minutes. Do you guys remember this? Move minutes? approval. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Second by Dan uh, I'll find the last approval one. by Must Mark. Second by Dan. All in favor? September. Yeah. Unanimous. Okay. Uh, Glendale Road. So this one is the A and R for the special permit for the. Um, and A and R stands for approval not required. So this is in the subdivision. It's um, carving off the lots that you guys already approved a special permit cluster amendment for. This was originally the Kensington State subdivision. Did we just do this. Yeah. You did, but this is the actual division, lot division. So you looked at the site plan and okay. special permit approval. Okay. Okay. This is the actual this is tech creation stuff. of right. the lots. So, and there, there are a couple of um, minor tweaks here to address some of the um, abutters' um, um, desires. But basically, I mean, it's the same. It's a 30-foot width for the total um, piece of land, but the driveway is going to be in the. Um, uh, off center from that, so there will be a buffer along that edge. If so you remember, Carolyn, how do you get comments from abutters for an A and R? You don't. You just not. referred to them. Well, this is because it's a city project, so okay. we're we're nego we were negotiating. Remember with the okay. neighbor here, and right. and so this is all this larger piece um, is all going to be open space um, conservation mm -hmm. land, and then it'll just be those habitat lots. So we're just in the final stages of getting this ready to close with Habitat. Do you want to explain to our newest member why you're asking our approval for something where approval is not required? <laughs> I don't know where to begin. <laughs> so, te so this, when you have um, legal frontage on a street and you want to create a separate building lot, as long as you meet the uh, minimum standard for the lot width along the frontage along the street, um, you can come to the planning board and say, I want to carve off this piece of property um, and it's not considered a subdivision because a subdivision is only for the purposes of creating road infrastructure and frontage infrastructure. So it's um, oddly named approval not required even though the board has to approve that it's not approval not well, required. Well, no, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Yeah. You could approve it, but it 
it is this it's plausible it is, than yeah it is <laughs> our <laughs> process that actually no uh, the statute says the board has to sign off that it they have to endorse the fact that it's not a subdivision yeah, you, you used okay. to do it, didn't you? Um, <laughs> I did, and then we were told that that was the interpretation was wrong. Okay. <laughs> On that note, can I get a motion? <laughs> so moved. Mark Second. moved it, it approved. Second. Allen seconds it. All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, Swan Street. Okay. This where one is, is where is Swan Street? That's over um, on the Marshall Street Day Avenue, sort of. Um, Eastern end of Bridge Street. Okay. Uh, where did my plan go? This is just a swap, land swap. So it's not a new lot to be created. Um, get north here. So Hubbard Avenue here, Swan Street. There's an existing house. They're just going to do an equal amount of land um, for the purpose of square off the parcel, and um, this garage is right on the property line so it'll give them more setback for the garage but it's just a um, 1500 square feet for 1300 square feet so it's almost equal any questions test moves to approve and seconds all in favor okay Request um, for reduction in letter of credit for the Northview State Hospital. Okay. So that's the PCOI subdivision development, the one that, Alan, you were talking about at the beginning, the northwest side, north of Ford Crossing. So this is, I didn't really, this is not an accurate description of what's um, being requested. They actually came in to you as their original performance guarantee was a covenant on all the parcels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've done a lot of work and they want to start and they have options on on a handful of the lots to be sold, um, to be built. So they want to modify and move from a 100% covenant on the entire thing to um, two lots under covenant, which is allowed and, and transferred to a financial performance guarantee. They don't know yet whether it's going to be a bond or a letter of credit. Um, we so the request to you conceptually is will you approve the transfer from an entire coven covenant on the entire parcel to a combination of a covenant on two of the building lots plus um, um, a letter of credit for the remaining amount of work they've done about 30 percent of the total project so the amount of, co of performance guarantee um, would be, we're saying at a staff level we'd want about 80% of the original cost, which is about around $800,000, um, to be in the form of a letter of credit. You all have to approve um, any of these performance guarantees. I don't have a, the one um, piece that I don't have for you at this time because we did realize this late. <laughs> this afternoon uh, is that um, I want DPW to find off, uh, sign off on the final construction quantities, how much is left of the work to do before we finalize that dollar amount. Um, so I guess the request for you is a vote to approve the transition from a complete covenant to a combination of covenant and performance guarantee with the dollar amount um, to be um, what the city engineer determines is um, left on the project plus 20% contingency. All of this is written in the subdivision rules and usually I come to you with an exact number. So I, I am asking you a little bit to allow staff to come up with that final number if you're comfortable with that. The issue is they need to, otherwise they would have to come back in a month from now because you guys are only meeting once in November. Um, so they would like to be able to make that transition. What, what's the to, upside for the, for the board in approving this? Uh, well, there shouldn't be any, it should be neutral. So really it just allows them to, sh they wanted to get going on the project so the easiest, quickest thing was to put a covenant on the whole thing. Now they've gotten some um, 
work done and they want to be able to actually sell lots. So I guess the upside is the project continues to move forward. They are able to sell lots and you'll start to see houses being built. Well, why can't they sell lots with a 100% covenant? Because they can't sell, because the lots are on all the covenant. The covenants are on all the lots, so okay, when the, okay. you can't transfer title. Okay. Okay. So they don't have a, in a sense, they don't have a clear deed. Right. Right. Okay. right. So they've got two buyers. questions about where it's covenant. Which is it's a, a covenant not to sell. Sorry. So the full to, so they have covenanted with the planning board that they will not sell any of the lots until uh, until or some other until some until they have built out the subdivision. That's the way the language is now. Okay. So but is we the eighty percent the subdivision build out that you were saying. So then what More we would do is transfer it to. 80% of the original cost to build the subdivision because they put so much money into it already so they've right. they've right. brought that total cost down because they've done the work so we would ask that they put enough money in there to finish the subdivision mm -hmm. and still hold two lots mm -hmm. under covenant mm -hmm. and then it releases the other 16 lots mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so okay. we'd be going from having a covenant on all the lots mm -hmm. to just two lots plus Six hundred thousand dollar performance guarantee. I'm confused. The the area I was looking at that I was referring to mm -hmm. <clears throat> didn't have any work on it. Was I looking at the wrong thing? I mean, there was a zero. Well, you the whole area that's clear. They've graded. They've put the detention basin in. They put the drain pipes in. Um, okay, nothing above ground. That's why I didn't right. see. Right, right. right. It's infrastructure. It's under, it's infrastructure. Right. I mean, there's no roads, no foundations. No, no, no. no. So no, the next no. part is they're going to start putting in the south base for they're the. They're not 30% built. They're 30% of the infrastructure. And that's what we hold the performance guarantee for. We don't care if they never no. built the. We don't care if it takes them 10 years to build out the house lots. The performance guarantee, I mean, I, I say that loosely. The performance guarantee <laughs> is for the construction of the road because nobody wants to be held hanging on to a half finished road mm -hmm. right. if they can't sell the lots after the road's done it's okay because markets can come and go and the lots will sell eventually but it's really just about the road infrastructure mm -hmm. so they've done road about, and other road and right. drainage and mm -hmm. yes right. water and sewer I move to are they pumping <laughs> i second <laughs> Um, no, they're connecting to the sewer and water line. And our posture uh, now process. is justifiably different than it was when we said the full covenant because they have put in so much money right, already. Right. Yeah. right. And they okay. can come back to you for partial releases at any time. Okay. They just need to show, here's what we've done, here's mm -hmm. what we have left. Mm -hmm. And so the next time they come to you, they're not going to ask for a lot reduction. They're going to ask for that bond to be reduced. <coughs> okay. Isn't this Just similar to Emerson Way? Where yeah. They yeah. Keep yeah. coming back. Right. Let's keep coming back. Yeah. Does anyone else have questions for Carolyn? Dan has moved to approve. John has seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. And I will come back and have you sign the final document once we get the numbers detailed. So I'll just give you a Call. shout. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Tess, seconded by Dan. All in favor? Aye. Thanks again for the